I'm here just to um, outline a little bit about the history of the place that I farm and love so much. Um, for those of you who don't know where it is, go out that door, turn right, keep going up the hill until you're not going up anymore, and then um, look to your right towards the sea, and that's what you look down. That's the sea, basically. <laughs> um, and to the north of it, there's 500 acres of woodland, which is Colburn Wood. It runs from Worth to Colburn Church. And then to the south of it, you have the moorland of Porlock Hill. East and west, you have neighbouring farms. So it's, it's got a bit of everything that you'll find throughout Exmoor, really. Um, now, farming has always been helped, hindered, interfered with, I guess, by government policy, um, especially since the Second World War. But when I think of our farm, <coughs> we haven't really been overly influenced in the way that we've farmed it. We've not reacted to, to money given by government in a way that maybe some farmers have. If you look at the headage payments, of course, you mentioned earlier, headage payments encourage people to ditch their breeds and go for a smaller breed because they can keep twice as many, twice as much income, fair enough. So we had Welsh Mountains coming to Exmoor, for an example. Well, they're called Welsh Mountains. They belong up a mountain in Wales, in, 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 not on Exmoor. So we stuck to the, the traditional breeds of Exmoor and Sheep and Devon Cup. And the other thing, my grandfather, when he was farming in the 30s and 40s, he resisted the change of um, being encouraged to push out your hedgerows and plow up every acre of land. He saw his hedgerows as being there for a reason, really. They were there to protect his animals in storm, and they were there to shade his animals in the summer, and obviously they were there also to be able to rotate the grazing of the animals. So he set about um, stone facing them. And according to my father, they were in a pretty shoddy state when he um, took the farm on as a tenant of the Lovers estate. Um, and so he piled into that work. Um, and I'm going to be careful not to leave my person. I might have to start reading in a minute, just in case you do. Um, and those hedgerows, um, which he stone faced, they were actually teeming with, and they are now, they're still there, they're teeming with life that we don't necessarily see. Insects, um, too many for me to mention, you mentioned just now, I think, the number of insects. Well, when you're taking out a piece of stone wall to, to renew it or putting a new one up, you see all these insects when you're digging the foundations out. Then you go up the wall, you see uh, mice nests and voles nests, and you see stoats and you see weasels. And then when you get to the top, the living part, on, on, I mean, they're this high, you know, three metres wide, you get up on the top, you've got the living part, and obviously lots of species of birds. But when my grandfather was doing this work, it didn't really enter his tiny mind that um, all this life was within the hedgerow, because to him, he was just farming. That's what he was doing, he was farming. But actually, you know, he was doing so much more than that. Um, and I think it, you know, that is a perfect example, really, of where farming and nature do, um, you know, they, they work together, they're in harmony. With, the two go together, they fit. So what worries me today, I guess, is um, the, like the big push back post-war to scrub hedges and plow every acre of land um, in order to increase food production, which at the time was necessary. Um, the big push today is to rewind plant trees everywhere, let it go natural, um, you know, and at the same time, the same people that are telling us to do that are then shaking hands <coughs> with countries from the other side of the world on food deals, importing all this food on diesel guzzling ships all across the world, not knowing what is happening to the environment where that food was produced, and it just seems to me that it's madness. So, okay, for fear of being too negative, I, need to <laughs> up, but I am actually hopeful, um, and I should have done that just now, to show you the down. although I know these are not Exmoor horns, um, they're crossbeds, I'm sorry about that. No, I don't, we should have taken photos of Exmoor horns really. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to do that as well, which is just a piece of stone warning, I think. It was definitely done by me, I think it was probably about four years ago. Now. Um, 
Yes, so if a fear of sounding negative, somewhere there lies a balance in the encouragement <coughs> of Exmoor's farmers to continue producing some of the best food in the world while being financially helped to support the byproduct of farming, which is a nature-rich environment. And I make an apology for saying that the nature-rich environment is a byproduct of farming. And I'm getting really thirsty. Would there be a chance of a little sip of water in the well? I'm getting very dry. <laughs> and we've only got two minutes left. <laughs> um, it is a, um, a byproduct, you know, of farming. So. Some of you, quite a few of you, certainly guys maybe on my right, would disagree with me when I say that, you know, it's a byproduct of farming in nature rich environment. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe it is, but I would say that your opinion has been formed with a full belly, always a full belly. And I think you probably, you know, you need to remember that. Um, so here we, you know, we really do have a chance to get this food production stroke environmental challenge that we face right. I've never talked so much. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've not talked this much for a long time. I've had a month's lamb, so I've not actually seen anything. <laughs> yeah, that's better. So we do have a chance to get this challenge right. And as a farmer, I feel that we need to be paid a fair price for the wonderful quality food that we produce, but also for the work that goes into the environment in which we produce that food, like my beloved stone-faced hedgerows. Yeah, yeah like that. Or, to coin a current buzz phrase, my beloved wildlife corridors, because that is exactly <laughs> they, they, if you look at the farm, they are corridors throughout the whole farm. Yes, they're not <coughs> two miles wide, but they, you know, they do serve a purpose. Um, so I think, how many minutes have I had now? She's gone, oh, too many. <laughs> um, so to finish, I just want to reassure all of you environmentalists out there, and there, that we farmers are also environmentalists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we have, <laughs> we do have the added skill of being able to provide some of the most amazing food in the world. And to all you Exmoor lovers, I would just say that while well, yes, there are bad farmers, just like there are bad teachers and there are bad doctors, there are even bad politicians. <laughs> Most of us do care deeply about our tiny patch of Exmoor.